We begin in Idaho with the case against accused killer Brian Koberger. I'm confused because if the defendant's alibi is that he was out driving around that night, I'm not sure what additional information his cell data could add to, to an actual alibi defense. It seems like what the defense is asking for, and they're being completely upfront about it, and I, I appreciate that, but what they're asking to do is essentially double check all the discovery before disclosing their alibi, and that's not what the purpose of an alibi deadline is. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Now we have some more insight, my friends, into where Koberger claims he was the night of the murders as his defense team has filed their notice of alibi late last night, claiming that, quote, Mr. Koberger was out driving in the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022. They go on to claim that cell phone data will show that Brian Koberger's mobile device was south of Pullman, Washington and west of Moscow, Idaho on November 13th, 2022, and did not travel east in the early morning hours of November 13th and thus could not be the vehicle captured on video along the Moscow Pullman Highway near Floyd's Cannabis Shop. And perhaps the most important thing about this, they say he was out gazing at the stars. That's that's right. They say he was stargazing, that he likes to go look at the moon and the stars at night. And that's what he happened to be doing the night that these four homicides were committed. What do you think about that, my friends? I've got two great guests I want to bring in right now to talk about this. They are, are cra uh, practicing criminal defense attorneys. We have with us criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Michael J. Brown, and also with us criminal defense attorney and professor Dante Mills. Great to have you both on the program this morning. Oh boy, what do we think? The jury will think of this alibi. Dante Mills, would you start us off, please? Good morning, Julie, Michael. It's it's interesting that they're coming forward with this alibi uh, information. Uh, the concern is, if you're a defendant, right? You're you're entitled. Uh, you're you're innocent until proven guilty. You're entitled to a defense. If you're a defendant that's saying you're falsely accused, you can't plan where you were going to be when a crime happened that you're saying you didn't commit. So it does sound a little bizarre that they're saying, oh, he was out stargazing, but what if he actually was? What if that's something he actually does? And this cell phone data can prove that he never entered into the neighborhood where these kills happened. We have the obligation. If we were jurors on this case, we have to be open-minded. We have to be fair and listen to the evidence and I think if they can show that through cell phone data, uh, then we have to say maybe he's not guilty, maybe he wasn't there, because if there was cell phone data presented by the prosecution that placed him on that scene, we would absolutely use that to say that he was there. Um, so we have to be open-minded at this point and see how all, all of this plays out. Sure. Uh, Professor, thank you for that. You said something I want to continue with. You said this may be something that he does, right? You know, you all know it as habit evidence, right? In the courtroom uh, for our wonderful courties at home, this is something that the rules of evidence provide for. If it can be really specific and really particularized, it can potentially come in in certain cases. So here, let's take a look at some more of what they said. They're saying here that uh, he has this habit of late night drives as an avid runner, hiker. He explored many areas after the school year began. Mr. Koberger was busy with classes and working at Washington State. His running and hiking decreased, but he did not stop. Instead, his nighttime drives increased. And this is supported by the data. This is what Dante was just saying from his phone, showing him in the countryside late at night or early in the morning on several occasions. Michael J. Brown, I'm wondering if this defense team is going to try to squeeze it in as habit evidence, even though, as you know, habit evidence has to be like, you know, my mother, for instance, habit evidence, going to church every morning of the week, you know, habit evidence, like same time, you're going to find her at the mess, you know, that kind of thing, you know, that's where she will be. Um, your thoughts on this, Michael, please. Yeah, I, I think, good morning, Julie, good morning, Professor. I, I think it's more about the alibi as opposed to habit. Habit, as you know, has to be habitual, it has to be every single day are so consistent. The alibi issue is really important because I think what the prosecution is going to try to show is they're crafting the alibi to the evidence that the prosecution has. And that's why they're objecting to giving up the cell phone data before they actually file this alibi notice. And alibi notices generally have to be filed promptly 
and you have to describe not only the witnesses, uh, but also the location where you allegedly were. But but remember now, the arrest was seven weeks after the alleged incident. And that's important because if I asked you, Julie, or if I asked the professor, where were you three days ago, you'd probably have a difficult time recollecting the specifics. Now you're trying to recollect and backtrack seven weeks prior. So in, in the defense of Kohlberger, it's tough to develop that. And once they get that evidence and data, it may jar his memory and support where he thinks he was. Yeah, great points, Michael. Thank you for that. Uh, you and Dante are good. I've said it many times on this show. I've said it <laughs> privately. If I ever, God forbid, get charged with a crime, I'm calling you two up. Uh, so let me bounce off of you. One of the things that I think is most damaging for Brian Koberger, that he turns off the cell phone during the time that officials say those homicides were committed. So take a look. His phone stops reporting to the network at 2.47 a.m. Police believe those beautiful young children were killed 4 a.m. 4.25 a.m. is the window they've been able to narrow down, you know, presumably through autopsies and other evidence. Koberger turns his phone back on at 4.48 a.m. And his defense team makes a point in saying in this alibi defense that he is out stargazing that night. He's looking at the stars and he's even got pictures of the stars on his cell phone. So why does he need to turn off the cell phone if he's, he can't take pictures if it's off? Dante, let me go back to you on this, my friend. Yeah, you're making us work here. It's criminal defense know, right? attorneys this morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, when you're out, your phone can die. I mean, it has to be the easy response, right? Very easy. Uh, he was out for an extended amount of time taking pictures, uh, using his phone to view the stars and things like that, and his phone just died. I think that's the easy explanation. I'm sure the explanation that they will use. Uh, but again, it was it's, it's ideal if you're alibi is somewhere where there's tons of people you can get affidavits from people saying this is where he was but he can't choose the time that a crime happens so if he's alone you have to use what you have if his cell phone dies clearly that's an issue uh because during the time of the murder there's going to be this blackout on his location but again if he's never pinged in that area if he's pinged in other areas then you can just say he wouldn't have had time to make it back over here or you know use those kind of things but it's going to be an issue that that period is blacked out when the murders may have or, or supposedly happen mm -hmm. certainly problematic no doubt a great conversation we're going to leave it there for now but of course we're going to be diving more into the Koberger alibi throughout the day on court tv live